Good morning. So today we have for this la last and final lab is inference for categorical variables. Um, more importantly, or more specifically, we're going to check out the chi-score test of association as well as the goodness of fit test. Okay, so to get ourselves started, we have a data set where um, 202 children with ear infections were part of the study. Um, this is a randomized clinical trial, and so what happened is these kids came into the center with an ear infection either in one or both ears. And so then uh, each child was randomly assigned to receive a 14-day course of antibiotics. Uh, one is uh, cephalor, probably saying that wrong, so go ahead and chuckle now. Let's call it CEF or amoxicillin. All right, I know how to say that one at least, A-M-O. And so the focus here is to um, determine if the the ear infection had cleared on the 14-day follow-up. So we've got the data set. I already went ahead and imported it. Um, we're, we can take a look. And so we've got ear uh, is the name of the data set. A couple of variables in here. Uh, ID, that's just the ID of the student itself, or not a student, these are children. Uh, and then we have clearance. So this is our variable of interest. This is a factor. Uh, this is R's way of just calling it a categorical variable with two levels. So it's either cleared or not cleared. Antibiotic, that is going to be our explanatory variable because we're asking the question, is there an association between clearance of an infected ear uh, and the type of antibiotic used. This antibiotic variable is also a factor with two different levels. So we have AMO or CEF. So those are the two types of antibiotics that were used. And then there's also this age factor, which for this lesson, we're not actually going to be looking at. All right, so uh, when it comes to this chi-squared test of association, I'm using that because I have two categorical variables with more, two or more categories. Now, I have mentioned that when you have two categorical variables with two categories, like we do have here, you could do a, a two sample Z test for proportions. That's because I could ask the question, is the proportion of ears that are cleared using the AMO uh, antibiotic different than the proportion of ears that are cleared with the CEF, right? I could ask that question. And I'm kind of almost asking that same question in a slightly different way. Uh, and that's why, you know, for this example, I'm going to use the test of association. But again, our scenario would really allow us to use either one of those. Okay, so in a test of association, the null hypothesis is that there is no association. Right? One variable has absolutely nothing to do with the other. Whereas an alternative, we believe that the type of antibiotic used might have an effect or is associated with clearance. So we can go ahead and you know, use this data to test whether or not there is um, evidence of an association. All right, so we're gonna jump right into exploring the data. When we explore the categorical data, you're really looking at a table of counts. Now, when it comes to this table of counts, uh, I'm going to use the table function. And the first thing that I list is going to create our rows. So our, tables, uh, our data set is named ear, and the rows usually corresponds with our response variable. So that would be clearance. So I hit the down arrow on my keyboard, I hit enter, and then that will fill it in nicely for me, so I don't have to do extra typing. All right, so I do have two variables that I want to look at. So creating a, a table of counts like this with marginal totals is our next step. The next thing that I list is going to be the variable that will create our columns. That variable is our explanatory variable, right? Because the explanatory variable really defines the groups that I'm comparing. And so that is antibiotic. So again, I'll type the name of the data set down to the variable antibiotic, hit enter, and that fills it in for me. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and hit run on line seven. My cursor drops down to line eight and I'll run ear.table so I can actually see the table of counts. 
Now this is nice and great, and in fact, if I was you know wanting to type this up, I'd go to my Word document, use these counts, maybe create a nicer looking table on my own. But it is nice to have totals over here as the rows, uh, and then the column totals also. Now I easily could bust out a calculator, do that myself. I could add those myself, um, but I could also use this add margins function. So if I use that and inside these parentheses, just type the name of the table that I created, if I created and saved it under a name, and if I run that, well, what I get is those marginal totals. So I get the row sums over here, I get the grand total down here in the corner, and then I get the column totals. All right, now if I wanted to actually look at some percentages or or first step would be proportions, uh, I can use the prop.table. And if I do that, right, the way that we've seen this before is I use prop.table in, you know, type out the name of the table. And if I hit enter at this point, what I get is proportions that use this grand total as the denominator, right? If I if I look, all of these added together equals 100% because I've you know just used that grand total as my denominator each time finding these proportions. So in other words, um, for the AMO and cleared, uh, what R did is took this 43 divided by 202. And there you have that. Well, that's not really what I wanted. I I have a group that use the amoxicillin, and I wanna know for this group, what percent or what proportion of the ears were cleared and what were not. So I want this group, the proportions for that group to add up to 100%. Now R will always work, if you don't tell it otherwise, as rows first, columns second. So I need to essentially tell this function, prop.table, hey, use the column totals when figuring out these proportions. So if I add another argument, this is just making more detail in my prop.table, the, um, the argument that I wanna add, it's called margin. And if I say margin equals two, that corresponds to columns. So it's going to use this 97 as a denominator when calculating the proportion for this cell and this cell. Um, likewise, it's gonna use 105 as the denominator when calculating the proportion for the CEF group. So if we run that, here we have our new table of proportions. And you can see that um, for this AMO group, if I add this number and this number together, I should get just about one, give or take a little bit of rounding error. All right, just to explain what this margins is doing, if I changed it to a one, it's going to use the row total as the denominator. So changing that to a one, notice that these two numbers in the rows would add up to one or 100%, but that's not what we want. I just wanted to show you what, what was kind of going on with this argument. So I'm gonna change it back to two. And if I wanted to look at um, percentages, I could just times this by 100. And so then I get all of those proportions as percentages. Heck, if I wanted to be really fancy, I could even wrap this in the round function. This is, I'm kind of going off script here, but that's okay. So if I wanted to round all of these just to two decimal places, just to kind of make um, it easy when I convert it over into, say, my table in Word, if I do round and I opened a parenthesis here, comma, at the end of what I want to round, and then I just want to round to two decimal places, and I'll end that parenthesis, set of parentheses anyway, if I run that, notice that this will do all of that really hard thinking for me and rounds those values to two decimal places. That is totally optional. I just figured I'd show that to you real quick. Okay, so now that we've explored the data, you know, I could definitely see that, you know, it looks like depending on the type of 
uh, antibiotic you used, gosh, the CEF antibiotic seems to be doing a little bit better. 63% of kids using that antibiotic uh, had their ears cleared compared to just a little, little less than half, 44%. So I don't know, we might find evidence of an association. We'll see. All right, so uh, the conditions of the chi-squared test is that we need to have expected counts all be greater than five. So in order to find expected counts, I actually have to run the test, but I have to just make sure that, you know, everything checks out once I do that. So to pull out the expected counts, I could do this one of two ways. I'm showing you both of these ways just to illustrate how flexible R can be when it comes to coding, right? There's not always just one way to do it. This first way, what I'm doing is I'm just running the test, but then once I run the test, what happens is expected counts are calculated and then saved. So I can pull them out with this dollar sign and then I type the name expected. So uh, this chi sq dot test, um, what I need to put into it is my table of counts. So ear dot table is what I saved. Oh, I didn't spell that right. I just clicked on that, corrected it for me. So I'm running the chi squared test with this piece, and then I'm just extracting out the expected counts so I can take a look at them uh, more specifically. So if I run line 22, I get expected counts showing up, and yep, they're all greater than five, so I'm good to go. Now, I like to name stuff, right? No surprise there. So if I wanted to actually run the test, but save all of that information as an object, I can go ahead and do that now. So I'm gonna do the same thing as I did before. I'm essentially taking this whole entire line and doing it in two lines, right? Two separate steps. So clearly this is much more efficient. I like to do this though, because I like to kind of take things in steps. So, you know, you pick your favorite. All right, so line 26, what I've got here is just a name, ear.test, and I'm gonna use the chi-squared.test function, and again, type in the name of my table, ear table, and I can run that. Now, the cool thing about doing it this way is now I have some, you know, an object that I can essentially call up and dig into a little bit later. Ear, uh, oh, sorry, we have uh, not table. I have an object here, which actually acts like a data set, right? Because it's under the data header. Now, if I press this down arrow, this is all the stuff that is saved inside of this um, chi-squared test, and I can pull out what I want. I can pull out the actual chi-squared statistic, uh, I could pull out the observed counts. Well, I've already did that when I created the table itself. I could pull out just the p-value if I wanted to. But down here, I could pull out the expected counts. So I'm going to type that exactly as it appears in line 27. So again, ear.test, that was the object that I created up here, and then dollar sign, and then the, the, the values that I want to pull out of it called expected, those are expected counts. I can run and notice I get the exact same output. So again, I'm just showing you the flexibility that R has when it comes to coding. I could be very efficient doing it in one line, or I can be a little more thorough and detailed doing it in two lines. All right, so knowing that we have expected counts all greater than five, I can actually obtain some output. All right, so get that output, uh, to get that output, uh, I've already actually ran the chi-squared test. I mean, I had to do that to actually get the expected counts. So I could just run the name, ear test, right? Here we have it. So I type that out and here's all the output that I need. It's not a ton. So the data was saved in ear table. We have uh, R types just an X, really that's a chi, so chi squared statistic is 6.95. We have one degree of freedom, that's because for a test of association, the degrees of freedom is rows minus one, times, columns minus one. 
So uh, with two rows and two columns, one times one is just one. And then uh, checking out a chi-squared distribution with one degree of freedom, and where this falls on that distribution, the area in the tail to the right is super little. Tiny, tiny, tiny. That is a small, small p-value. So with a small p-value, we can say that there is strong evidence to support the alternative. So there is strong evidence to suggest that there is an association between the antibiotic that is used and whether or not the children's ears are cleared 14 days later. All right, the only other thing that I was going to do, I see that I have this um, typed out. If uh, you didn't recognize that we'd actually ran this test up above, um, I'm just doing chi squared dot test, type in the name of my table, run that as it is, and then again, I get the same output as I did before. All right, I get this output, uh, same output because Again, this line, I just saved all the output under the name and I ran the name so it accomplishes the exact same thing. All right, so moving on to our next problem. This is gonna be a goodness of fit test. So we use a goodness of fit test when we have only a single categorical variable of interest, right? We don't have this other variable. So for this example, we have fruit fly data. So fruit flies of a certain type can be either yellow or ebony. They could have normal wings or short wings. Okay, so genetic theory provides us with a distribution. Um, genetic theory says that about 18.75% of fruit flies are ebony with normal wings. We'll call those EN. Uh, 6.25% are a uh, percent are ebony with short wings es 56.25 percent are yellow with normal wings yn and then finally we have 18.75 percent are yellow with short wings so to test this theory uh, a researcher took 100 of these types of fruit flies and recorded the distribution of these traits so in other words, he counted uh, how many were ebony with normal wings, ebony with short wings, and so on. So um, I am looking at a lab activity that I have written out, and uh, you know I just have a table of counts that I need to essentially get into R so I can go ahead and do this goodness of fit test. So in order to type in data, um, I can kind of do this one of two ways. I could do it the long way where I would type the name of the data set, C, and then I would start listing out the things that I want to combine. So if I use EN to represent ebony with normal wings, the data set that I'm looking at says that he recorded 11 ebony with normal wings. So I could type this out 11 times, get a little tedious, right? <laughs> because he's recorded data on 100 fruit, fruit flies. Well, I don't want to do that. That's going to take way too much time. So I can speed this whole idea up by using the repeat function, since I really am just repeating the same thing. So inside these um, outside parentheses, right, I'm going to use the repeat function multiple times. I can use the repeat function to repeat anything I want, any number of times that I want. So if I want to use EN to represent ebony with normal wings, I'm going to, in double quotes, type EN and then comma and 11, uh, because that's that second number, that's how many times I want the first thing to be repeated. So just to be clear, if I run just this little portion here, you can see what's happening. I've just repeated that 11 times. Now I'm going to do this for the rest of the data set. Um, what I'm looking at here, ES, that's ebony with short wings. He found 10 of those in the data set. And each REP function, repeat function, is separated by a comma. That's important. Okay, so now I'm going to repeat yellow normal 59 times. And then finally I will repeat yellow short 20 times. 
And again, I'm looking at a table of counts within a lab activity. I'm not just making these numbers up as we go, um, but that's where I'm referencing this stuff. Okay, so now I have the data set um, written out. I can go ahead and run that whole line. Uh, I have highlighted this whole piece. Uh, I also could just leave my cursor in that line 45. Two, two ways of getting to the same spot. Um, I'm going to clean up this global environment a little bit better. Okay, so now we have the fly um, set of values. All right, this is recognized as just a data vector. And so uh, what I need to get it as, all right, what I need from it is an actual table. I need R to recognize it as a table, not just a vector. So I'll use the fly underscore TBL name to save this table because I'll need, to need it a few times later on. Uh, I want to use the table function and I'll just type in the name of my data vector, fly. Okay. Now earlier on in my first example, I used the table function and I added um, uh, a second variable, right? We had one variable making up the rows and one variable making up the columns. Well here I just have the one variable, that's it. So I don't need to add anything else. All right, so running these two lines, you can see that I have 11 ENs, 10 ESs, 59 YNs, and 20 YSs. So there's my table of counts. And um, you can see here over in values, R is recognizing it as a table. Now I need a table sometimes because these later functions like the prop.table function needs to have a table put into it. <laughs> so that's why I like to sometimes save these under names so I could just type out the name instead of the whole function again. All right, so prop.table, uh, what that will do is get these counts into a proportion for me. This is kind of optional stuff that I like to do. So I'm going to type in this prop.table, the name of the table, fly underscore TBL. And earlier on, I, in the example above, I added a margin, right? Margin equals two. Again, I did that because we had a two by two table. Here, I don't. I just have one row of counts. All right, so what this will do automatically is use the grand total here, that would be 100, to find all of these individual proportions. And that's exactly what I want. And there's no second variable, so there's no margins to worry about in this case. Okay, so I ran line 52. Now I'll run the name so that I can get to see those proportions. Well, remember our sample size was 100, so you know it's not too difficult to just get those into proportions even on your own. All right, just for the sake of showing you or reminding you of some additional code, we could create a bar plot. Now our variable here does have four categories to it. Uh, I think that just looking at these proportions, that's sufficient. I don't know that I would waste my ink uh, to create a bar plot for something as simple as this, but for the sake of illustration, we'll go ahead and type this out. So bar plot is the, co the function that I use to create a bar chart, and I need to first provide it a table. I could provide it a table of counts. Uh, I could provide it a table of proportions. Uh, let's go ahead and do proportions. Why not? All right. We Pick your, pick your favorite. So I typed fly and it recognizes the data vector itself, the table of proportions, and the table of counts. So I'm going to go up to the table of proportions, hit enter at this point just to have it um, fill it in automatically for me. And then I add all of those lovely arguments to make this colorful and bright uh, and interesting, right? So I have a main title. I have an X label title, Y label, I'm, I put in proportions, and then I can't forget some color. Let's see, maybe just a red. We'll do something like that. So I'm going to go up to the top, line 56, hit run, and there we have, ooh, that red is quite dramatic, isn't it? Maybe I'd pick a different color, <laughs> a little more subtle. 
Uh, anyway, uh, what you can see is um, things that I don't like. I don't like it when the bars are taller than my Y axis. Ugh. See, now knowing that that's the case, I'm going to go back up here, do a little edit. I'm going to increase the Y limit. I'm going to make it bigger. Okay, so uh, this Y limb needs a range. So I'll use the C function to create my range. And I want this the Y limit to start at zero because I can see that that's probably a good place to start. I know that YN, the yellow with normal wings grouping, uh, goes up to almost 60%. So maybe I'll give myself a little bit of wiggle room and go up to 65% or 0.65 since these are all proportions. Okay, so now I'm going to run that again. Oh, that looks much better. All right, that looks much better. Even then, um, it stopped it at 60. It thought, Julie, you don't need more than 60% on this Y limit. I certainly have ways of forcing it to do what I want, but in basic R, I think this is going to be just fine. All right, so we are going to use the chi squared dot test function again. And, um, but we have to recognize that this is a goodness of fit test. So a goodness of fit test needs these theoretical proportions uh, so that it knows what null hypothesis we're working with. Okay, so let me see if I can, since I'm doing this on the fly, I don't know how well this is going to copy over. But I, from my lab activity, I'm going to copy over the null hypothesis. Uh, that's not so bad. I think that'll work out okay. So let me just clean up what I've copied over just a little bit and then I will explain what we're staring at. Okay, so uh, when I am writing out the null hypothesis for a goodness of fit test, I list out essentially all of these theoretical proportions for each of the groups. So P is my uh, symbol for proportion. Now, uh, really, this should be a subscript, right? So a subscript EN, so P with a subscript EN represents the proportion of fruit flies that are cat categorized as ebony with normal wings. And the problem uh, told me this is 18.75%. So as a proportion, 0.1875. So again, just because I copy pasted real quick, these capital letters, E, S, Y, N, imagine those as subscripts if let's say I was writing this out properly in some Word document, okay? All right, so here we have all of these theoretical proportions. I need those in this argument now, again, because I'm doing a goodness of fit, not a test of association like I did before. So just make sure that you note those differences. Okay, first order of business, I'm gonna just go ahead and save this under a name, all right? Because you know me by now, that's my style. That's the way I like to do things. Uh, I'm gonna use the chi-squared.test function, which requires me to put in a table. Uh, the other thing that I need is those null proportions. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put P equals and inside this C function, I'm going to list out those proportions according to alphabetical order. That's the other thing to really keep in mind here. So when I created the data vector, I used EN, ES, YN, YS, and I listed them that way because I wanted to place them in alphabetical order. Um, because I know that's how our functions. Uh, and so I like to just keep that consistency. So EN is the cat one of the categories that's in this uh, fly vector, right? EN right here. Um, and so I know that the first null proportion I need to list should be associated with that first category that comes alphabetically. So 0.1875. Okay, then I just go in order again alphabetically. So I will list 0 0.0625, uh, comma, 0.5625, comma, 
and 0.1875. Okay, so I've listed all of those theoretical proportions and, oh, excuse me, um, I want the correction. So the correction method, um, we can go ahead and just leave that as false so that I'm not doing any type of um, uh, correction. I'm just going to do the chi-squared test as is. Okay, so here we'll run line 71 and we'll look at all of that fabulous output in line 72 and here we have it. It's very similar um, as before. This calls it a chi-squared test for given probabilities, or given proportions. Uh, another name for that is a goodness of fit. Um, whereas I believe up here, Yates cotton continuity or we're, we're doing a Pearson chi-squared test with the continuity correction. I don't really explain that too much, not have to worry about it since our sample sizes were pretty large. Um, but here we're testing for given probabilities so it even kind of gives you a hint of what test you're doing. All right so we have a chi-squared test of 5.67, degrees of freedom is 3, so for this goodness of fit test, the degrees of freedom is number of categories minus one. So four categories minus one. And then we have a rather large p-value. If I'm using a significance level of about 0.05, certainly this is above that. So what I would have to say then is that there is insufficient evidence to suggest that the genetic theory um, for these fr fruit flies is not true. Right. In other words, I could say that there is not enough evidence that um, the theoretical proportions are uh, are incorrect. Right. Our data does not suggest that the um, proportions should be changed at all. All right. That is what I have for you. Remember that the chi-squared tests do not have any type of confidence interval uh, for them because the goal is to determine if either goodness of fit. Uh, the data is inconsistent with theoretical proportions or a test of association. It tests if there's an association between the two variables but doesn't target any type of estimating. All right, well take care everyone. It's been a pleasure. I uh, hope that you found these labs interesting and we'll talk soon.